Hello, and thanks for joining me. One of the most famous mistakes in literary history occurs in the book Robinson Crusoe by Daniel Defoe. After being stranded on an island far from civilization, the title character first strips naked and swims out to his wrecked ship, and then fills his pockets with food. In the 300 or so years since the book was published, many people have taken delight in pointing out this contradiction. And if no wars or crusades or pogroms have started over the issue, it's only because everyone knows it's a work of fiction, so who cares? Imagine how much human suffering would have been averted if people had the same view on the Christian Bible, with its hundreds of apparent contradictions. I don't spend a lot of time talking about the Bible on this channel or about matters which are specific to Christianity. I don't criticize Christian doctrine much because every time I do, there is some denomination somewhere in the world that rejects that doctrine as well. I've mentioned my sister-in-law in the past, the one who's a member of the clergy, and I can tell you that most of the things I hate about Christianity, she hates about Christianity as well. But some of my viewers have suggested that it might be worth my while to talk about problems with the Bible. And what better way to start than with biblical contradictions, or to use the softer term, inconsistencies. The idea behind talking about contradictions or inconsistencies is that if one passage of the Bible says that X is true and another says that not X is true or entails that not X is true, then both passages cannot be factually correct. At least one of them must be wrong. But this is not possible if there is nothing wrong in the Bible, as many Christians claim to be the case. So to the extent that Christianity is predicated on the Bible having no errors, Christianity is false. This has no effect on those forms of Christianity which are not predicated on the Bible having no errors, and many of those Christians will probably think the worst of me for going into this subject at all, because I'm not disproving Christianity. And I'm okay with that, because as a general rule, the form of Christianity believed in and practiced by those people tends to produce less misery and suffering than the form of Christianity believed in and preached by the inerrantists, or the fundamentalists. I'm content to let more liberal forms of Christianity slide, as it were, in this video. That being said, let's talk about contradictions. Now, it's important to say this at the outset. Any contradiction in the Bible, or in any text, can be reconciled with enough creativity. If you were really invested in believing that Robinson Crusoe was inerrant, for example, you could say that Crusoe found a nice set of clothing on the wrecked ship and put it on. For a biblical example, when the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all say that Simon carried the cross, and the Gospel of John says that Jesus himself carried the cross, this is usually harmonized by saying that, well, Jesus carried the cross for a while, then he put it down and Simon carried it the rest of the way. This scenario is described nowhere in the Bible. Matthew, Mark, and Luke do not mention Jesus carrying the cross for any length, and John does not mention Simon's role in carrying the cross, and neither mentioned any kind of a switch-off. So, when you're harmonizing two inconsistent verses in the Bible, you're saying that when the author of book A says that P happened, and the author of book B says that Q happened, number one, P and Q are both describing event R, Number two, one author, inspired by a perfect deity, would describe R as P. Number three, another author, inspired by a perfect deity, would describe R as Q. And number four, and this is the most important one, either this actually happened or something less plausible than it actually happened. People who try to harmonize the Bible might like to think that they don't have to think of the actual explanation for the apparent contradiction, just a plausible or even a possible explanation. Something that explains how it might be reconciled, just to prove that the contradiction isn't necessarily a contradiction. But they're actually making a claim when they put forth such a proposal. They are claiming that either this happened or something less plausible than it happened, because if they could think of a more plausible explanation for the inconsistency than what they gave you, they would have given that instead. Of course they would have. So when apologists claim that the Bible is inerrant and then attempt to harmonize the apparent contradictions, they are setting a maximum level of plausibility. They are setting a ceiling to the plausibility of the Bible, a point higher than which it is not possible to attain. And consider that projects which attempt to harmonize the entire Bible are basically one very long conjunctive proposition, with each individual conjunct or each part of the conjunction having various levels of improbability. One such project is a book called The Skeptic's Annotated Bible Corrected and Explained, 
which is a full-length response to the Skeptics Annotated Bible. It's written by Jason Gastrich, a small-time minister at the time whose most notable credential is he was one of dozens of people to run in the 2003 California gubernatorial recall election, you know, the one which saw the rise of the governator. And, somewhat remarkably for that election, he actually got more than 10 votes. By which I mean he got 11 votes. He seems to have vanished off the internet since then, but you can still buy the Skeptic's Annotated Bible Corrected and Explained at Lulu, home of such fine books as God Is by Armando Calvo. Actually, not anymore. Armando's book has been taken down and it's no longer available anywhere on the internet. I wonder why. Anyway, assuming Gastrich is intelligent and competent, or used intelligent and competent sources, you have to believe that everything in this book is true, or else that something less plausible than what is in this book is true. Because, again, if he had a more plausible narrative, he would have offered that instead. Every explanation that they are proposing, or something less plausible, has to be true in order for the Bible to be inerrant. Only one has to be false in order for the Bible not to be inerrant. To the extent that inerrantists don't choose to be inerrantists, you kind of have to feel sorry for them. They believe what they cannot defend. To the extent that they do choose to believe it, and I know this moves away from the strong doxastic involuntarism that I've pushed in the past, but if inerrancy is really something that a Christian chooses, I got no sympathy. Inerrantists are fond of saying that the burden of proof is on the person who claims that a contradiction exists. To the extent that we are claiming that a contradiction exists, and not merely evaluating the claim, the equally positive claim that no contradiction exists in the Bible, this is not a heavy burden to bear. Because an apparent contradiction is a prima facie case for an actual contradiction. If something appears to be the case, then you have a prima facie reason to believe that it is the case, based on the principle of credulity. So when I point out that the Synoptic Gospels appear to contradict John as far as who carried the cross, that is not proof positive that an actual contradiction exists, but it does shift the burden to the inerrantists to overcome this evidence. The fact that Simon and Jesus might have taken turns carrying the cross means absolutely nothing unless it is the case that the authors of all four Gospels meant, in their own incomplete ways, to describe that event when they say that only Simon or only Jesus carried the cross. Is it possible that that's the case? Sure. Is there any positive reason to believe that it is, in fact, the case? No, not really. Unless you have a pre-existing dogmatic commitment to the inerrancy of the Bible. When it comes down to it, the game of reconciling biblical contradictions is a game of invention. A good example is what Judas did with the 30 pieces of silver which the high priests gave him for betraying Jesus. In the book of Acts, he used the silver to buy a field, the field in which he later died. But in Matthew, he repented of what he did, threw the silver at the priest's feet, went to the field, and hanged himself. And the priests, realizing they couldn't put it in the treasury because it was blood money, bought the field themselves after Judas' death. I think the common reconciliation here is that the priests bought the field on Judas' behalf, basically acting as real estate agents for Judas. So, you know, it was the same as saying that Judas bought the field. But this doesn't work. Matthew makes it pretty obvious that Judas doesn't want anything to do with the money, and the purchase was made after his death. So they're inventing a detail here, which is that Judas basically says, what have I done? I have shed innocent blood. I don't want your dirty blood money. Here, take it back. By the way, could you use that to buy the field? I'm going to commit suicide in after my death. And the priests say, well, we were going to put that into the treasury, but it's blood money. So yeah, we'll go ahead and do that. That exchange is not recorded anywhere in the Bible. They have to invent it. They may say that they're inferring it instead of inventing it, but it's only inference if you already assume that the Bible is inerrant. Without that assumption, it is in fact invention. And this invention doesn't work anyway. If I give my cousin $30 and my cousin gives the money back to me and says, hey, I don't want your blood money, and I use the $30 to buy like a video game, which I then give to the estate of my cousin after he dies, it is simply not true to say that my cousin bought a video game with the $30. An even more serious problem concerns how Judas died. Matthew records that he hanged himself in the field, while Acts records that he fell headlong into the field and his body burst open and his bowels gushed out. The common reconciliation here is that he hanged himself, the rope broke, and he fell to the ground and his body broke open. To make this work, you have to invent two details. First, that the rope broke or the branch broke or something like that, and second, 
that his body actually inverted 180 degrees as he fell to the ground. Because if you hang yourself and the rope breaks, you're going to fall feet first. But Axe records that he fell headlong or head first. So basically, he hanged himself, the rope broke, and he very quickly thought, well, this sucks, I'm going to have to think of an alternate way to go out. Uh, I know, I'll pull a Greg Luganus. And he did a swan dive into the ground. A modern theory states that the word, which has usually been translated as head first or headlong, actually takes an alternative meaning of being swollen up. And it was this meaning that the author of Acts intended, even though he used another word for swollen up elsewhere in the account. So Axe was saying that he fell while his body was swollen, and that's why his body burst open and his bowels gushed out. So, okay, to believe this, you have to believe that the author of Acts, when describing the death of the greatest traitor who ever lived in the history of humankind, didn't bother mentioning the fact that he was hanging himself. The author of Matthew didn't bother mentioning the fact that he apparently had some kind of medical condition that made his body so swollen it was ready to burst like a ripe fruit. And neither of them mentioned the rope breaking. Is this possible? Sure. Is it reasonable? By itself, maybe. I mean, if this were a rare moment of discord in an otherwise pristine and unimpeachable set of eyewitness testimonies, then maybe we could swallow it. But when considering this in conjunction with all the other apparent contradictions and other problems, I mean, let's not forget, Matthew also speaks of zombies rising up and walking the streets of Jerusalem at the time of Jesus' death. Why should we give this author the benefit of the doubt when it comes to objective reporting of the facts? This I find very unreasonable. This not to mention the fact that Bible editors don't really believe it. They believe that when the author of Acts said headlong, he actually did mean headlong. Because they still render the word as headlong or even head first. And some of them will add in a footnote that, hey, this can also mean swollen up. If they really believed that he meant to say swollen up, they would have rendered the verse as he fell while swollen up. And maybe in a footnote, this can also mean headlong or head first. I don't know of any Bible translation that actually does this. Here's the thing, I'm not interested in a critical examination of the scholarship that Christians produce in order to shut skeptics up. I'm interested in a critical examination of what Christians actually believe. And going by what their translations say and what they bury in a footnote, they believe that the author of Acts is saying that Judas fell head first, which is inconsistent with him having hanged himself. This is why I am unimpressed with those who, when they say the Bible is free of errors and contradictions, qualify this to mean in the original manuscripts. They don't have the original manuscripts. They've never read the original manuscripts. When they think of what to believe, they think of whatever translation they were accustomed to when they were children and or when they rededicated their lives to Christianity under the poetic guise of being born again. This is what they live by. This is how they vote. Again, I'm not interested in the scholarship they produce just to shut skeptics up. I'm interested in what they actually believe. Now, I don't see the point in producing here a long list of contradictions because that would only provoke a long list of attempted reconciliations from would-be governors of California. But I will just quickly share with you what my favorite contradiction is, and it's my favorite because first, it's so easy to express, and second, there's really no way to answer it other than by throwing all reason out the window. It has to do with when Jesus was born. Matthew has Jesus born during the reign of Herod the Great, while Luke has Jesus born during his census under the governor Quirinius, which we know from the historian Josephus took place 10 years after Herod's death. Most attempts to reconcile this contradiction seem to involve giving Quirinius another earlier governorship, which idea contradicts all available historical evidence. Some people suggest that Herod actually died much later than history records, or that when Luke said the census happened during the term of Quirinius, he meant before Quirinius. These suggestions also contradict the available evidence. And of course, if you're going to go with what the author of a biblical document meant to say instead of what he actually said, then hey, you can use that tactic for every contradiction. You can say that when the author of Acts said that Judas fell and his bowels gushed out, he meant to say that he hanged himself. Why not? What's to stop you? Other than, you know, the likely reason you're trying to harmonize the Bible in the first place, which is that you want your faith to appear rational. 
Or you want to stem the flow of Christians outside of the faith because they can no longer rationally maintain their faith, which is fine. But it precludes making silly arguments like when Luke said X, he meant not X. Apologists will say that we're not supposed to assume that certain passages mean what they say because of context. The Song of Solomon is erotic poetry, for instance, not a historical narrative like the Gospels. But this is a red herring. No, Mr. Green. Communism is just a red herring. As far as I know, no one is seriously claiming any biblical contradiction involving the Song of Solomon, which, as the apologist says, is erotic poetry, whereas there are dozens of apparent contradictions between the Gospels. If the authors of Matthew, Mark, and Luke all saw both Simon and Jesus carrying the cross, is it reasonable to suppose that they all would only mention Simon carrying the cross? If the author of Acts saw Judas hang himself, saw the rope break, and saw his body fall and burst open like a ripe fruit, is it reasonable to suppose that he would only mention the falling and bursting part? Now, the common response to such questions is that each writer had to pick and choose which details to incorporate because paper was rare and expensive back then. But this is simply absurd. And to understand why it's absurd, you simply need to do exactly what the apologist wants you to do and look at the context. The men who wrote the Gospels weren't just writing documents. They were writing documents under the inspiration and presumably with the blessing of an omnipotent creator of the universe, with an urgent message for all humankind, past, present, and future. He is not going to be thwarted by a paper shortage. If the Gospel writers were truly inspired by God, then we have no reason to expect anything less than four masterpieces of clarity and completeness, albeit from different perspectives. So the question is not whether apparent contradictions exist. They do, a great many of them. Nor is the question whether inerrantists can reconcile these contradictions. They can. All they need is some smaller or larger amount of creativity. The question is, does the end product pass the smell test? When you read something like The Skeptic's Annotated Bible Corrected and Explained, when you look at the narrative produced by a work like that, does it really make sense that the Bible would express that narrative the way it did? Does it really make sense that the revealed Word of God, the God who had a critical message for humankind, would inspire this particular work to convey what is, in the end, a completely different narrative? If the apologist wants us to look at context, then I think it becomes pretty easy to explain the whole thing, because the context is that the writers of the Bible were expressing what they believed, what their tradition was, and or what they were trying to persuade others to believe. They were none of them expressing the literal, historical truth about any supernatural event. If that's the context behind the whole thing, then, and only then, do the contradictions in the Bible make sense? If you enjoyed this video and want to help my channel grow, please hit the like, share, and subscribe buttons. Be sure to hit the bell to be notified when a new video comes out. And if you want to share your favorite Bible contradiction or the most hilarious attempt you've seen to reconcile a contradiction, leave a comment below. A huge thanks to all my Patreon supporters. You help make this channel possible. If you'd like to become a supporter, see the link in the description. Thanks as always for watching, and we'll see you in the next video. I'm David John Wellman, and the rest is up to you.